So good afternoon. My name is Timmons Roberts. I'm a professor here in the Institute at Brown for Environment and Society. I'm an environmental sociologist, so I don't count myself as an environmental humanities person. But I think there was some strategy in inviting me. I have directed environmental studies programs at um, three universities now. And um, I've always been a avid supporter of the need for humanities in these programs, which are typically dominated by natural scientists and the occasional policy person. Um, and, and humanities are often, well, um, ignored or actively excluded. Um, and I don't think I'm, whatever, I, I don't see any of my colleagues from, <laughs> so I can say things like that. Well, fortunately, it's a humanities person who is here, so. Um, you know, none of those people came to this event, I'm very sad to say, and I, but I think it's, a, you know, it's revealing. Um, so this is the second session on exploring methods, and um, the last session in what's, what seems like a really exciting conference. They say that the videos are gonna be up in a week or two, so I guess they'll be on YouTube, and I'm really impressed with the quality of what's being filmed. Uh, so it should be a great resource um, for our teaching and for our work. So in the first session, we heard Kyle White um, de describing indigenous political eco-philosophy, you know, the ethical, political, and moral side, including an adaptation to climate change um, and the need for real decolonization. We heard Vera Candiani talking uh, sort of about um, this long history of very interdisciplinary um, explorations of environmental history, if I can say that, in Latin America especially, um, and the, the sort of new explosion of interest in the field and um, some of the profound questions of methods and I thought very provocative questions about uh, whether scholarship should serve activism and, and then that particular relationship. So I hope there'll be some more about that in this session. In this session we have Dale Jamison from NYU School of Law um, and he's a professor of environmental studies um, and philosophy. Uh, did I get that right? I think so. And yeah. Affiliations. And then, then you're the director of an animal studies initiative uh, at NYU. Uh, and he's uh, rec he's got a hundred books and chapter. I'm sorry, articles and chapters. <laughs> it feels like a hundred books, a lot of books and um, edited volumes, especially. And um, he's got uh, a, a book, a recent book um, from Oxford University Press, Reason in a Dark Time, Why the Struggle to Stop Climate Change Failed. And then we're gonna have, and he's gonna be talking about, as you can read in your program, sorry, um, environmental humanities problems and prospects, should be interesting. And then uh, Gregory Cushman from the University of Kansas, who's a associate professor of um, in environmental history, and um, he's, he has a book about guano and the opening of the Pacific world, a global ecological history. And from having talked to him some at lunch, um, seems like he's really uh, a, global, <laughs> a global historian, you know, really trying to um, connect the natural history and works with a lot of natural, natural scientists. Um, some work on phosphorus and the opening of the Anthropocene, um, his current project uh, with Carnegie Fellowship is a book on the Anthropocene uh, and um, the Mineral Kingdom, a global history of human rock relations, something like that. So he, we're gonna hear more about that, I'm sure. So um, each of you gets about 30 minutes and then we'll have lots of time for discussion and then we'll have drinks and the drinks are gonna be one floor down. So you'll wanna stay for that. <laughs> Dale? Well, thank you. Uh, so Timmons was even more excited about the drinks than about my CV. I mean, um, you know, uh, normally, um, normally the, the, the first obligation of academics is to inflate their own CVs, but it, I'm happy to have Timmons do that for me in the future. Um, so in, in recent years, I've been getting invi invited to a lot of environmental humanities conferences, and, um, and I like to accept these invitations both because I learn things and also uh, because I'm, I'm curious about why me? And what am I doing there? Um, what is this stuff that's environmental humanities? And usually uh, when I go to these conferences, I just do what most people have done at this meeting, which is to present my work. 
But with the active aid, complicity, and permission of the organizers of this conference, uh, I've decided that instead what I'm going to do is to just put it all out there on display. My own ambivalences, insecurities, uncertainties, uh, and confusions about environmental humanities and where, if anywhere, I fit into this whole picture. Uh, I feel like a lot of the uh, talks earlier today have either prepared the way for my talk or simply substituted for my talk, and you'll have to decide which. Now, since I don't actually have, as they say, an argument uh, or a set of conclusions or even a thesis, I thought the best way of, of trying to do this talk would be to tell you three tales in three different voices. But unfortunately, I'm not a very good actor, and I also get faint of heart very easily. So, so let me give you the notes to the script so you can sort of try to interpret the way this really would be done if it were being done by somebody who is better at it than me. So the first tale is the tale of self-presentation. And so what I would do is I would wear the clothes that I would normally wear to go see a dean, for example. Right? And I would speak in a very sober, third-personal voice, third-person, and I would talk about, well, the environmental humanities is this, that, the other thing, this is why you should give us money, this is why you should fund our conference, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so that's the third-person uh, voice. The second tale is the undermining tale. And here what I would do is I would put on a fedora and do my best Matt Drudge imitation and I would come up here and I'd go, you environmental humanist, you're doing this for this reason, this is what sucks about your field, et cetera, et cetera. But I don't really have the courage to do that. So, um, but, but think of that tale as being the second voice tale. Then the third tale is gonna be my story, which will be in the first person. That one I can pull off. Sadly, that will probably also be the longest and it's hard to talk about oneself without sounding narcissistic. And indeed, it's hard to be an academic without being narcissistic. So, um, so I'll, 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 I'll do the best I can because, with this, because what I want you to do is just to see the three of these as three tales about the environmental humanities with, with no particular conclusion, although one very short afterward. So, so, so that's what this talk would be like if I were better at delivering it. So imaginative reconstruction. So first then, environmental humanities uh, in self-presentation. And, and most of what I say here are just simply quotations taken off of various websites and reports and so on. And I've highlighted things that, uh, that I think are particularly important. And since I'm very bad with PowerPoint, I will actually read most of the slides. So environmental humanities, a new field for a new millennium. Since the beginning of the 21st century, a new, a new academic field has emerged, the environmental humanities. This interdisciplinary endeavor developed simultaneously in many parts of the world. It achieved a self-conscious international identity and a name after decades of research by individuals and after the formation of academic associations interested in environmental issues. What does environmental humanities encompass? Well, by way of disciplines, the environmental humanities are the traditional humanities, such as philosophy, literature, religion, art, music, history, language studies, cultural geography, conjoined in a new interdisciplinary formations to address the environmental crisis currently engulfing us, its antecedents, current forms, and future trajectories and possible responses to it. Meta comment. Anthropology isn't on this list, which is kind of interesting. And other lists like this that one gives sometimes includes history, sometimes doesn't, sometimes includes anthropology, sometimes tries to include the qualitative social science wherever Timmons is. You're not necessarily banished from the tribe. Um, okay, now what does environmental humanities encompass by way of topics? From climate change to toxic waste, from biodiversity loss to deforestation, we are slowly realizing that science, technology, and economics simply do not have all of the answers. The time has come to take the humans involved in environmental issues as seriously as we have taken our fine-grained analyses 
of climate, ecosystems, hydrology, and all the other facets of our, quote, natural world. That's also a key that there are some humanities people here. You can't say natural without putting in quote marks. End of meta comment. This is the task of the environmental humanities. Okay. Um, so what are the insights of the environmental humanities? Science helps us to understand the effects of what we are doing and how we may do better. The humanities helps us to understand how varied are the forms of human culture and society and how some forms promote and even normalize environmental violence. Questions of values have traditionally belonged within the humanities with a focus on human diversity and humanity's embeddedness within ecological systems. It is possible to think creatively and how we may live differently. Okay, so to try to kind of summarize then the self-presentation, there's a kind of push and a pull. So the push towards environmental humanities comes from the observation that science is not enough. And we can talk a lot about the chasm between is's and oughts, for example. Science tells you how the world is. It doesn't tell you what you ought to do to make it a better place. Um, but the second, third, and fourth bullet points, which basically are all mutually reinforcing, is that even if you adopt policies that are on your side of the odd, these policies can be quite vulnerable and highly contingent. It may be true, for example, that whales are worth more dead and alive unless we can figure out some more high-valued use for them being dead, in which case the economics changes, the policy changes. Um, so, uh, so I think one of the things that drives the environmental humanities as opposed to science or one of the felt needs is the idea that if we're going to move to whatever sustainability means or whatever this green utopia is at the end of the road, it's going to require some really systematic, really substantive value change. It's not just a matter of the contingent calculations uh, of a benefit cost analysis where a game theoretic a salience happens to occur at a particular moment or whether some particular policy is supported by some particular court or Congress or president. So that's what pushes us towards environmental humanities. What does the humanities offer? Well, it offers reflection on values. It offers imagination. It offers diverse perspectives. It offers context, historical context, cultural context, intellectual context. A lot of the talks we've had today have given us that kind of context. It gives us texture to the issues we face, thick description. Uh, it also broadens the domain of inquiry. Often what is most important is what people don't say rather than what people do say. Uh, often what's important to investigate are presuppositions, tacit beliefs, and commitments. And the humanities also tend to pride themselves on reflexivity, particularly about knowledge production and about knowledge claims. So the self-presentation picture, so this is the last slide to show to the dean or the provost or the president or to God, is something like this, joining hands with science, the environmental humanities will save the planet. So the, so the idea is that if you're really serious about these, about this, sorry, this, the environmental crisis we face, you need the environmental humanities. The sciences can't do it alone. We have to play together and walk off into the green utopia. Okay, so now comes the undermining thing. All right, you, now it's an undermining story. Okay, that's, that's the end of my attempt to be in character. So the undermining story says, the environmental humanities is not really about saving the world, it's about saving the humanities, okay? <laughs> and there's all kinds of data I can give you um, about the perceived crisis in the humanities. This is just one sort of slide uh, about American universities and sort of the halving of degrees in the humanities on a percentage basis since, uh, since the 1970s. Um, but the idea is really that the, that, that the environmental humanities is just fairly typical in the, in the sort of opportunistic, trick, tricksterish way of the humanities of starting to try to figure out how to save itself in a hostile environment. 
And this really gives rise to what I think is the most serious challenge to the environmental humanities, which I call the sincerity challenge. Very simple challenge, but it's what I think you get from a lot of environmental scientists and a lot of environmentalists. And basically, you know, we're not stupid. We understand sociology. We read the newspaper. We see what's happening to the humanities. The humanities is collapsing and looking for a life raft. Um, and, and part of what's compelling about that explanation is the environmental humanities was invented in the new millennium, right? It's not as though we didn't have environmental problems that were actually civilians were actually worried about and thinking about in the last millennium. Why are the humanities so late to the game if they're really concerned to save the world rather than themselves? Moreover, um, again, I'm in character now, so don't, don't throw things at me. Um, the humanities is governed by intellectual fashions. Um, there have been so many turns in the humanities, the linguistic turn, the animal turn, the environmental turn, that sometimes I get dizzy trying to keep up with all of these turns. Right? And moreover, there's a kind of thread that goes through the humanities to be sensitive to the latest currents of political correctness, however you want to articulate that. The, the, env the environmental concerns are a new form of political correctness. They get tacked on to all of the other forms of political correctness that have dominated the humanities for the last generation. So that's basically the sincerity challenge. You guys aren't really sincere about this. You're trying to save yourselves under the guise of trying to save the world. Moreover, you can't even really do this, even if you were sincere. And, um, and, and that's because, first of all, actually, the humanities is radically disciplinized. Uh, in my lifetime in the academy, uh, people in the humanities hate joined departments. There's been this imperative to separate departments. Philosophy and religion departments. It used to be normal to have philosophy and religion departments. The thing people get really upset about is trying to separate themselves. No, we're philosophers. No, we're religious studies people. Don't put us with those other nasty people. Um, right? And, of course, it's the opposite trend in the sciences, where you actually get biochemistry out of biologists and and, and chemists. So actually, um, uh, you know, despite the rhetoric of interdisciplinarity and so on, the humanities are been and still are to a great extent interested in differentiation, actually, rather than the opposite. Uh, and in fact, there's also a huge amount of diversity across these humanities uh, disciplines. In fact, there's so much diversity, it's hard to say, well, what are the contributions of the humanities, as opposed to history, as opposed to literary studies, as opposed to philosophy or whatever? Um, partially because of the high level of disciplinary self-consciousness, it's very hard to say what this humanities thing and its contribution is supposed to be. But even within disciplines, people are heavily siloed. The power of subfields is very great within humanities disciplines. And we heard some of that today, actually, um, those of us who were sort of eavesdropping on the historian's discussion about particular subfields of history and how they, and how they play well or don't play well with other subfields of history. But the same story could be told of other disciplines as well. Generally, even though we're all very nice people and we like to drink together, humanists don't collaborate in the way that scientists do. I mean, this is just a very simple thing about just, just, just look at the table of contents of a normal journal, and the typical scientific article has multiple articles. Humanists basically, after drinking with their friends, go home and write something by themselves. It's a, it's, it's a very different culture. Humanist, humanities generally or often doesn't interface well with the natural sciences. Now, this is not true of all humanists, quote unquote, but, but it's often very, very difficult to actually do this interface. And sometimes it's actually even willingly so. And I, I mean, I've actually had people in the environmental humanities tell me, for example, that they see no reason to actually know anything about science, that it, they see it as irrelevant to their projects in environmental humanities. I'm not saying that's typical or whatever, but it is, it is out there. Um, and you know, part of what's going on here is that humanities folk tend to problematize uh, rather than problem solve. And again, that's a cultural difference between the humanities and some other fields uh, of endeavor. So when you take the sincerity challenge and put it together with the 
you, you can't even do this even if you want to, objections. You wind up with the sincerity challenge in its starkest form. Environmental humanities is a dance by and for other humanists. Right? It's not really about saving the planet. It's not even really about playing well with scientists or social scientists. It's a game that humanists play with each other. Evidence for that? The exclusionary language that is often used by the humanities, which is often impenetrable to people outside humanities disciplines, and not necessarily because of technical terms, often because of neologisms that are sort of willfully introduced. One way to make your reputation in the humanities is to invent a word. Um, the indifference or even hostility to science and finally, the patterns of publications. Most work in environmental humanities gets published in humanities journals to be consumed by other people who are interested in the environmental humanities. Nothing wrong with that. That's just business as usual. And it just doesn't square very well with the self-presentation model. OK, so now we get to me. So now I'm going to tell, tell you my story from the first person point of view and then leave it to you to figure out what, if anything, these three stories have to do with each other. So. So I grew up with lots of animals. I grew up surfing in San Diego. I did a lot of math and science when I was a kid. And then I went to a religious boarding school for six years where uh, Greek, Latin, and German were inflicted on me, all of which I was very bad at. So I started college as a classics major, transferred quickly to English and then to sociology, which when I was in college was halfway out the door anyway at that point, if you were a sociology major. So of course I dropped out of college. Um, I became uh, an anti-war activist, and then I later got an undergraduate degree in philosophy and one in religion, and then went on to do graduate work, which I'll tell you about for a moment, in a moment. But, um, but I was going around denouncing the Vietnam War as immoral, which I was certain that it was, and in fact getting um, physically abused for doing so. Uh, but I realized one day, although I was sure this was true, I didn't actually know what it meant. And I saw that there was an ethics class being taught in night school. And so I thought, oh, if I take this ethics class, then I'll find out what it means to say the Vietnam War is immoral, which it surely is. So I took this ethics course, and I just fell head over heels into philosophy in all of its depth, uh, all of its forms, and in uh, all of its esotericness. And, um, and the reason for that, to a great extent, was the emphasis on analytic philosophy, on truth, argument, clarity, following things wherever they went, and not particularly being concerned about the ideological ramifications, what you could say to whom on what occasion, and so on. And during this time, when the Vietnam, when the government was essentially a big propaganda machine, which is something that's very hard to identify with these days. And the student left that I was involved with was dominated by warring, large warring ideologies. The focus on clarity and truth seemed to me to be the most emancipatory and liberatory activity that one could engage in. So, um, so, so I did sort of technical stuff in philosophy of language. My first job was at North Carolina State University where Tom Reagan, who is a name that may resonate with some of you, wrote a book called The Case for Animal Rights, was my colleague. I was already vegetarian because I was this countercultural guy from California, so I didn't have any particular uh, skin in the game of eating animals, but I thought the idea that this could be an ethical issue that you could philosophize about was kind of a totally loony idea. Um, but more and more I found myself being drawn into these issues about uh, the ethics of animals and increasingly to the environment. Um, and so in 1980, I got my dream job offer, was at, which was at the University of Colorado Boulder, and wanted to go back to the West. And they called me up and said, the good news is you got this job. The bad news is you have to teach something called environmental ethics, which barely existed at that point, with a scientist from the National Center for Atmospheric Research. So after hesitating for a nanosecond, I said, no problem. And so I went to Boulder, and this is back in the day when people wore glasses that looked like that. Uh, I taught a class in environmental ethics with a scientist from NCAR, 
who's actually from Providence, Rhode Island, Mickey Glantz. And the class was a complete disaster. Uh, we had no idea what each other was talking about. And the only real takeaway from the class is we really liked each other, and we liked hanging out with each other, and we kind of wanted to understand each other. And through that relationship, I ended up getting a part of my appointment at the National Center for Atmospheric Research, which was where a lot of the early climate change work was being done. And I hung around a lot with these two guys, uh, who were Warren Washington, who was basically running the climate modeling group there at the time, and Steve Schneider, who a lot of you will know as the sort of public face of climate change from much before he passed away. Uh, that's Steve being the public face of climate change. This is Warren, who one of the great moments in the Obama presidency, from my point of view, is getting the National Medal of Science from Obama. And I kind of started to learn to do research in a different way. I was doing my day job as an analytic philosopher, but I was also kind of learning how to try to do environmental research. So the first project I did was on the Navajo Indian Irrigation Project, which was essentially one of these projects where um, the Navajo were the senior water rights holders for much of the lower Colorado Basin. But these dry water rights did them no good because they had no way of impounding the water. So basically, for decades, people just said, hey, it's your water. It's true, it's going by you, and other people are using it, but it's your water. So a deal was essentially made where the government built a big dam uh, and created this irrigation project, and the idea was to transform the Navajo, which, as you know, are migratory people in terms of season, seasonally migratory, and uh, in many cases, you know, are more interested in animal agriculture, but the idea was to turn them into farmers working on Soviet-style collective farms. So that was an amazing eye-opening experience for me. Nothing really came of it in terms of research, but as a new way of doing research, interviewing people, doing archival research, uh, it was an interesting thing. It was sort of part of my story. I worked on an air quality study in the Colorado Plateau. That work did end up getting published in, under the category of good enough for government work. It was, um, and then I ended up leading a large project for EPA on cultural barriers to pollution prevention, which was about all of the non-scientific, non-economic barriers that affect pollution prevention. So things that have to do with people's values, with people's practices, all of that kind of stuff. A fair amount came out of that project, but I got so fed up with EPA. I think I'm one of the few people in the history of EPA to give back um, an amount of money that was, more, that was a six-digit amount of money, so that was an interesting experience. But my first climate change paper was in 1988, and it was called Grappling for a Glimpse of the Future. Um, and so I... So I'm just going to read this out because it's relevant for what comes later. So good scenarios about various subjects are found in a broad range of different literatures, novels, histories, anthropological, geological, and biological accounts. Some of the most useful scenarios of our time have been produced by writers as diverse as Darwin and Brecht. As I've described, this approach may sound more like science fiction than science. Uh, a good scenario concerning global warming may be more like the small stories embedded in everyday discourse than like a Russian novel. Perhaps some of the significance of climate models rests implicitly on their evoking stories about what it would be like to live in worlds with different climates. Now, so I got these two jobs. I'm doing this environmental stuff. I'm maintaining my disciplinary credibility. At some point, I decided I need to do some resume laundering and to try to bring these identities together. So I went to Carleton College uh, into the first endowed chair on the human dimensions of global change, and then I went to NYU to found an environmental studies program. So I'm just wrapping up now. This is a short talk. Uh, but just to give you then a sense of what I've been doing just in the last few years, um, I wrote a book called Reason in a Dark Time, um, Why the Struggle Against Climate Change Failed and What It Means for Our Future, which came out in 2014 and um, was greeted by many, many people thinking I was just excessively pessimistic. And when the paperback version came out last year, I was, was greeted by many people with saying I was prescient about the future. Um, the year after, I wrote a book with a novelist named Bonnie Nadsom, was a wonderful, wonderful novelist called Love and the Anthropocene. And this really goes back to that 1988 paper about telling stories. I think the thing about the Anthropocene uh, 
the big story about the Anthropocene isn't catastrophe because, as it's been pointed out, the world is a catastrophe. It's been always been a catastrophe. People live with catastrophe. The story of the Anthropocene is the banality of the ongoing catastrophe for those of us who are involved in generating it and benefiting from it. So in some way, the theme of Love and the Anthropocene, which is two essays, an essay on the Anthropocene, an essay on love, and then five short stories, is the story of the banality of the ongoing catastrophe as it lurches ever further uh, into the future. And then the next book, which is impressed now, is a book that's co-authored with Naomi Oreskes and Michael Oppenheimer and some other co-authors as well, and it's called Discerning Experts, the Practices of Scientific Assessment for Environmental Policy. And so it basically looks at the history of assessments on Antarctic sea ice, uh, on acid rain, uh, and on ozone depletion, and tries to understand not, I mean, not what their external effectiveness has been, but what was going on inside of these assessments in terms of question framing, what counted as answers to the questions, how research agendas got set, and so on. Okay, so what does this all mean? I've told you three stories now. Um, and I'm only going to try to take, uh, to have three takeaways. So the first is, the first two are very personal. The third one, I think, is actually true. <laughs> so the two personal ones are, first of all, I think it helps to give up on trying to know who you are if you're actually going to find yourself, um, especially if you want to work in these interdisciplinary spaces. The more you hang on to your disciplinary identity or think of yourself as having a trajectory or a particular focus that you're sort of marching through, uh, the less likely, I, for me anyway, you are, I think, to find your voice and the, and the real problems you should be addressing. Secondly, you need a friend or a buddy with whom you spend a lot of time and for whom you have a great deal of affection. That's what Mickey Glantz from Protestant Rhode Island was to me because in these relationships, you start in mutual ignorance. You have no idea what each other's talking about. Then you move on to mutual intimidation. You understand what each other's talking about enough so that you're terrified because you're sure the other person is so much smarter than you and knows so much more than you do. And then finally you get to mutual respect and collaboration. But you can't do that without someone who basically you don't love. Um, so is this environmental humanities? Well, I don't know. I leave this up to you and to discussion. But, I, but the one thing I'm pretty sure is true is that generalizations about anything, including the self-presentation story and the undermining story, even if they're true as generalizations, are almost never true to the felt experience of individuals as they live inside of those generalizations. And so I think that's one of the things that makes me a very bad judge of how to answer this question. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dale. And now we're going to have uh, Greg Cushman, uh, how to make the environmental humanities central to teaching interdisciplinary environmental studies from the start, a case study. As people walk out with that very boring title. Um, while you're getting that booted up, I'll go ahead, I'll go ahead and, and start here. Um, some of us have been, we, in the whole last uh, um, presentation that Dale just did, um, focused on positioning ourselves before we go into positioning what is the environment of humanity. So I want to do exactly that. I am a descendant of and am myself a settler and academic colonist, always with a gaze to the next horizon. This is generation upon generation of experience in my family, continually seeking to engage and understand the other. I'm a Latin Americanist and Pacific World Specialist, but uh, in the process, inevitably learning more about the fuck-ups of my own fuck-ups and those of my forebears, despite the highest of moral intentions, and also how difficult it is to, um, turning out to be to struggle against repeating those same stories of my forebears. This continual gaze toward the horizon extends to my positioning with regard to disciplinary silos, which you thankfully have introduced perfectly for me. With, uh, which have a massive epistemological cost. That's one of the ar central arguments here. Notwithstanding the immense value 
of fermented silage produced by these silos um, that then produces disciplinary cattle with the fattest of CVs on an industrial scale. So one of my questions is, a serious one, does institutionalization of the environmental humanities as an autochthonous discipline, I think we heard that word earlier today, have intrinsic value? What are the environmental humanities anyway? One way of approaching this issue is very different from practically all of us here today, um, these last two days, is to consider the eminently practical matter of how environmental arts and humanities scholars and scholarship um, teach, and also how we interact with the biological, physical, and social sciences in an institutional context. What do and what can environmental arts and humanities contribute to the teaching of environmental understanding and engagement, especially at the introductory level in colleges and universities? So that's what I really want to focus on here. And what are some best practices or workable practices, to be a little bit more modest, um, for doing this that we might share with one another? Rather than addressing, answering this question strictly for my own research, uh, which I love to talk about, of course, because I'm a narcissist like all of us, I'm going to use my own quite irregular and anecdotal experience teaching at a large state research university, presented in the genre of a microhistory, to reflect on the possibilities, prospects, and pitfalls of building, I'm increasingly impressed about how this has turned out, a truly interdisciplinary environmental studies program at the University of Kansas that places the environmental humanities and all of these different sciences in intense engagement from the moment that undergrad and grad students begin their coursework in these programs. And to help illustrate this, I'm going to provide a little taste of my own Andean research on first science, as I call it. As another practical matter, I find that the environmental arts, humanities, science and technology studies and social sciences are so tightly enfolded, and many of the presentations that we've here, seen here make that so abundantly clear, that uh, environmental humanities is, for a lot of ways, just simply a shorthand that we use for a huge diversity of things. And as Dale pointed out, that's one of its central challenges, is it's really, it's a shorthand. We need to always keep, realize that maybe there's not such a meaningful reality to that shorthand because it encompasses so much. Um, in practice, I only began using the term environmental humanities, um, not to talk to deans, I'm not important enough for that, but as a way to distinguish what I and my and several other human-oriented colleagues um, do in comparison and contrast to the glaciologists, geologists, ecologists, climate scientists, etc., that I've taught alongside in classes, um, particularly in a co-teaching an introductory environmental studies course series of two semesters, um, and uh, also an introductory grad level course, uh, 15 times now since fall 2008. So I've invested a bit of time in this. Here's my argument. Um, the situation at KU is in um, many ways typical of environmental studies programs at similar institutions with quite modest resources. In other ways, well, one nice thing about that, I mean, this is doable in many different places. So resources are not a, a too, as big a problem as you'd think. In other ways, though, this experience is highly, highly exceptional, and I think one reason why you might find it of interest, um, perhaps even could be inspirational. And I'm very interested also to hear in our discussion, sec in discussion some of your experiences that might be relevant to this. Uh, as a historian presenting a microhistory, this microhistory may also help us to reflect on the changing place of the humanities in the contemporary university and perhaps help us think about this pervading, pervasive sense of crisis, maybe even provide an antidote to this, although Dale's undermined that in his undermining. Uh, um, the fedora-wearing Dale. Um, it is possible, again it's an argument, it is possible I think to build a flourishing undergraduate program in environmental studies with environmental humanities as an integrated cornerstone, period, semicolon, from a program that was once dominated by environmental scientists. So that's a major change that I've witnessed myself and participated in. Um, all the more so because, again, of the few resources that we have, the open admissions policy um, serving a uh, uh, relatively modest state 
uh, that you may have heard of in politics, and where the average student is acutely concerned with career prospects. Environmental studies students actually take our major because it helps them get a job in a very tangible way. They can see that. People come back and tell them that. Um, this highly collaborative and laborious, uh, although not too laborious, curriculum building experience that I've been involved in has, had a, has made major opportunity costs as well as benefits where my own personal career development is concerned, as initially as an early and now a mid-career scholar. That said, here I'm actually going to say who's benefited the most of all from this. This program has been a major boon, remember these are introdu big introductory courses, to graduate students, especially graduate students in the environmental humanities who aren't paid as much as those in the sciences, and so um, scientists don't often want to teach these courses, so environmental historians, people uh, doing environmental literature, the GTA positions are there for the taking, and who then use these opportunities for financial support to bolster their training in all things environmental, and in the process, at the end of the game, with their newly minted shiny PhD in, the ha in hand, being able to say, look at this that I've done, that might be something that might be useful here, and again and again and again have gotten um, professional jobs, tenure track employment um, in environmental studies programs in particular. A little bit of historical background before diving into the micro study. Uh, the Yale School of Forestry, originally founded in 1900, is an example of a professional program that has provided a home for interdisciplinary environmental studies over time. It, in the process, it's provided numerous faculty and also model for natural resource management programs, not only in the United States, but all over the Americas. Um, one example of, of uh, an envoy from, the, from this program is Starker Leopold, uh, son of the much more famous uh, Aldo Leopold, who brought this educational model and insights, not only from that program, but also from his father, to the Mexican Wildlife Survey, and then later to UC Berkeley's program, in which there was a humanistic element uh, always through that, although I think that's more the fault of his dad than of Yale. In the late 1960s and 70s, in rough parallel, and this is an interesting correlation, not causation, I think, in rough parallel with genesis of what we now call ethnic and cultural studies, a number of colleges and universities, large and small um, in the Americas, established environmental studies programs to appeal in particular to students and to faculty interested in a more holistic approach to environmental understanding and engagement than they could get in a regular discipline. The program at um, UC Santa Barbara established in 1970, where Roderick Nash, among others, made his uh, career home, is an exemplar, I think, of this movement, a particularly successful one. Um, this trend was widely viewed by its protagonists as a critical way to show that this isn't really something from the new millennium. It was considered at that point a critical a way in which uh, students of the environment could contribute toward solving broad societal problems related to the world's environmental crisis. And to get in, and I'll link this to the microstudy of KU, KU's environmental studies program came into being in this exact moment as one of the oldest environmental studies programs in the country, founded in 1971. And here's a really important point. With a founder's effect, ecologists, many of whom are employed by what's now known as the Kansas Biological Survey, were the dominant force in the organization and the maintenance of this program over time. One thing I've learned in interacting with other people in environmental studies programs over time, even back when I was a um, very new graduate student, is that it's a truism, um, and, and correct me if this has maybe changed, but that environmental studies programs tend to have either a biological or physical or societal sciences bent, depending on which, oftentimes, on which group set them up originally, that endures and endures and endures. Academia is very conservative um, when it all comes down to it. KU's environmental studies program still has an ecological bent, uh, an ecological bent and that had consequences. This founder's effect eventually inspired dissent, especially among physical scientists, concerned with the program supposed, and they would always term it this way, uh, I'm repeating what older timers have told me, lack of rigor, quote unquote. Which, uh, man, here's what that meant. It meant lack of mathematical skills with students. Um, chops to do advanced physics, 
use differential equations to solve things, all that kind of stuff. And I have to say, that was and remains a genuine limitation of the program. This debate eventually, after as it said so many times at so many meetings, inspired quite a bit of resentment, even personal and rancorous yelling. Um, and for a time, made the program have a reputation of being dysfunctional. And I actively avoided the damn place during my first few years at KU. Lesson here, um, both from the way I'm narrating this in part, is that so-called interdisciplinary programs can be tragically unfriendly towards interdisciplinary engagement due to, the inter due to the disciplinary bent and biases of their constituents. No surprise there. Um, the skills issue, you guys hear this in every, all the time in the work that we're doing now, has over the long term often generated more organizational problems than solutions. And above all, was actually actively resented by students because this need to make sure they have skills often led to the geological accumulation of, of requirements in which the ones, that are the, the ones at the top of the list are often so old they seem to come from a different geological age. <laughs> Meanwhile, now step back a bit, because this is a case, environmental humanities, and from what I've heard a bit about my colleagues here uh, from Brown, it's not, not uh, much like this, this place. Environmental humanities began to take root very much on its own, separate from all that big mess at KU, and helped along decisively, and also to give away, thank you to the, uh, to the Kogut Center for Humanities, the Hall Center for the Humanities at KU, endowed by the founders of the Hallmark Corporation, so every time you buy a Hallmark card, you're helping KU out ever so, so slightly. Um, the Hall Center for the Humanities provided a home for this. Personalities, it so often does, mattered profoundly in this. Um, a lot of you are already familiar with this story. Don Worcester, an environmental historian especially interested in the history of ecological ideas, and with a background in American studies, was appointed Hall Professor of American History in 1989. He was the second choice, as everybody likes to remind him and me. <laughs> Others had aspirations of turning KU into a center for urban history. Sure. He just recently before that, Ben, this is something I heard before I even got to KU, get, uh, getting my PhD at the University of Texas. Uh, Got to include some gossip in here, right? Um, he'd been a finalist for the Walter Prescott Webb Chair at the University of Texas, originally held by Webb himself. But because of Worcester's perceived communist sympathies, and that's exactly how the dean described it, and some pretty intense behind the scenes pressing the thumb down on junior faculty who might want to get tenure someday, and if they didn't vote a certain way, destroyed the possibility of him getting fired. The dean, in fact, even took the chair away from history and gave it to uh, geography um, as punishment for bringing this character. And so, no Don Worcester, Alfred Crosby super team at Texas. Boy, that would have changed my life, potentially, my, my alma mater. Back to KU. As Hall Chair, with an office at the Hall Center, so place matters in this, Worcester worked to make the Humanities Center a home for environmental engagement of many kinds, most notably by getting an NEH grant to help provide a bit of money to bring people in from outside, um, something that turned into an advanced disciplinary seminar on nature and culture, which has been meeting monthly for over almost 25 years now. Um, and that became a model for a host of other advanced seminars at the Hall Center on a variety of topics from colonialism to the digital humanities. So it became a model actually for how to do interdisciplinary humanities stuff. So yes, it is great to have a great when building an environmental humanities program. But the story of how environmental humanities became a cornerstone of environmental studies, how to make that a connection, only involved Worcester as an ancillary figure. Um, my own position, let's see, I'll skip that. Lesson here, contingency and conjuncture, two processes of great methodological interest to historians in particular, are valuable to think of and just as important to academic political history as they are to other realms of history. Further details of the contingencies that allowed us to remake the environmental studies curriculum, I could go on and on about this. These aren't really important. Um, we got a big NSF Eigert grant. We had a new director who wasn't, um, who crossed the social, physical, um, I should say biological boundary. Um, and university-wide curricular changes, which will often throw a giant monkey wrench into things. Um, there's the monkey wrench. Um, 
all contributed to this. But the question I want to answer now is, what did we do with these contingencies? How do we use these as an entry point to make humanity central? So now we're going to jump off the cliff into the ocean. Two colleagues of mine with co-appointments in geography and environmental studies had long shared this, what we all thought was a pipe dream. So wouldn't it be great to create an introductory environmental course series of global scope that truly integrated from the beginning biological, physical, social sciences? And then me and an Afri African literature scholar also have been talking our own pipe dream of, wow, what, what if the humanities were in that too? We interacted, everybody's been involved with these things and they uh, usually end after the buzz wears off. We had interacted frequently at this nature and culture seminar. So again, the importance of that home and with area studies programs. Um, all of us had an interest in the global south that I think actually is influential in why we ended up being successful. One, Chris Brown is a biogeographer specializing in bees, soybeans, and Amazonian development. Another, Johan Fetteman. I want to read their names to show this is not me, the single uh, individual humanities guy. This is a collaborative enterprise as much about their actions as, as it is uh, at mine. We all contribute to this. Another, Johan Fetteman, is a climate modeler intent on understanding long-term human-generated lands cover change. So you need to know the history of why land cover is changing in order to make the models represent some version of reality. Um, you know a little bit about me. Um, Byron St. Angelo, an eco-critic, joined the group soon after. One thing that brought us all together is that we all were teaching on our own as individuals discipline-specific introductory courses of our own that were, had aspirations to be global and transdisciplinary, and we're doing it in parallel. And one day, we sat and said, you know, we could teach this all at the same time and not have to change a single thing except get a bigger room for all of this. So rather than waiting around to do a top-down curricular form with a bunch of often contentious and disinterested colleagues, much less all the levels of administration up above, to get things rolling, we simply put everybody in the same room and caught one co-top keyword, one big course, and started from there. Next semester we did this again, although we altered the content in order to move towards having a two semester course series. Getting the whole global environment from all disciplinary perspectives is a little bit too much for one semester. Crucially, and this is a case of, here I actually think this is a best practice that I can pop my uh, collar or pop my lapels. Crucially, we incorporated a weekly two hour laboratory often led by GTAs who had a lot of control about what happened in there, so they're part of this creative process too, which generated a plethora of opportunities for field trips, hands-on activities, and small group instructions, helping make a giant class work on a much smaller scale. Just a quick question, how many of you have done involved or involved in something that you overtly called a laboratory from the humanities perspective? So three, four, um, let's make a wave at the Environmental Humanities Lab at uh, KTH in, in Sweden, directed by former KU postdoc Marco Armiero. Um, this laboratory provided is so important for making this work. In fact, we've even made a case in which faculty will lead an honors lab each week that then teaches how the lab is going to work for all of the different graduate student-led um, labs during the subsequent weeks, so helping us scale this up. Um, things we might do with such a thing, um, making use of local resources is important. Um, field trips to the KU Natural History Museum, which isn't just important for its collections and the research going on there, but also in this is an historically important diorama of North American mammals and biomes that was originally presented at the 1893 Columbian ex Exhibition and carries a lot of that baggage, including another exhibition nearby, of the last survivor of the Battle of Little Bighorn, um, of, of Little Bighorn uh, on the white guy side, a horse. Um, how do we make this work? Um, in many ways, this had a conventional structure of a large lecture laboratory course. Typically, the same trio of instructors from, again, across disciplines, 
planned the course together, attended more so together, and absolutely key, at least when the most workable group of people came, to, came together, we would interact intensively as co-instructors, as participants in the class, every single day, asking questions of each other and modeling interdisciplinary engagement in the process. Teaching ourselves in the process how to engage with someone who might be an expert in climate modeling, um, someone who might be an expert on um, literatures in the global south and everything in, in between. Learning to talk to each other and in the process helping students, at least this is the idea, um, see how one might approach doing such a thing. Um, here I have a brief, uh, that's a not brief at all, description of the, how we frame the two semesters of the course. And there's nothing more boring than walking through the syllabus the first day of class. Um, if you'd be interested in, in seeing some of this material, please um, send me an email. I'll be happy to share some of our material, materials and also some of our laboratory exercises who might be interested in this. Um, we, one thing to note is that we've also used this model to help develop graduate level introductory courses focused in the first place on climate change studies, partly with the support of the NSF and more recently now with the Anthropocene that I think have been in some ways even more successful having multiple instructors in the room, um, but a smaller group of better prepared uh, and experienced students working quite, quite well. I wanna now, as, the, as, par as partly the conclusion of this, try something out on you. How does this work in practice? I'm going to give a little piece of a lecture that I give in front of everyone um, that seeks to explain, tell a narrative of the discovery of the El Nino phenomenon, something that I, is one of my research fields. So keep in mind, pretend you're a fly on the wall in a room full of undergraduates with um, other co-instructors who I'm also speaking to, so think of yourself as a co-instructor. I'm gonna present here, um, um, present here this little vignette. In part two, um, I'd like to get some feedback from you. Uh, selfishly about the, the extent to which this is effective in injecting humanity's perspectives into a narrative about scientific discovery. Uh, I think it was um, um, Macarena Gomez Barris who made a really important intervention yesterday regarding how important it is from an environmental humanities perspective to use our control over the narrative whenever, whatever that narrative is, to, in, to in order to make that narrative more inclusive, whatever that inclusivity might be. So this is definitely one of the core goals of presenting the beginnings of El Nino research in a specific way. I've become convinced that the environmental understanding of first peoples has much to do, has much to teach us about the physical manifestations, cultural meanings, and moral ramifications of environmental change and variability and much to teach us about what science does and why. Outsiders interested in sustainability science have given increased attention to indigenous understanding of the environment, particularly in the rapidly changing Arctic. First peoples living close to the land and sea have proven especially adept at detecting qualitative signals of environmental change and recognizing the complexity of interrelationships between phenomena at the local scale. So what is this concept first science? I like to use this term to provide an alternative shorthand, uh, much less unwieldy label for what is variously referred to in the literature as TEK, traditional environmental knowledge, or IKS, indigenous knowledge systems, or more commonly, native or indigenous science. In its most obvious sense, first science refers to the knowledge of first peoples. To be first also implies particularly from the perspective of working scientists now, like some of, them, some of us in this room, also implies foundational significance and priority of discovery. And I think that's especially relevant for El Nino. But the term is also meant to communicate a set of attitudes towards indigenous knowledge. It rejects the false dichotomy between traditional knowledge and modern science. Two domains of knowledge that have been in dialogue since the so-called scientific revolution. It also recognizes the lasting problems that can result from selective, one-way expropriation of traditional knowledge, as in histories of bioprospecting. 
Most significantly, it draws attention to repeated cases in which indigenous knowledges and practices have provided the basis for adapting to grave environmental and societal challenges. Ancestral dystopias, to use a word we heard today. And for sustaining, sustaining durable, resilient relationships between nature and culture, even in the most difficult of circumstances. It recognizes that first science is not static in time, nor doomed to disappearance, but involves a process of development as its progenitors have learned from mistakes and successes and adapted to changing circumstances. The central insight here is that many ideas and practices categorized as belonging to the domains of religion or superstition, remember students in the main audience, turn out to have enormous practical value in things like scheduling activities, in guiding observations, in deciding what is to be done, who will do it, and when, in transmitting knowledge and wisdom from generation to generation, and in maintaining the natural order, what we'd call the natural order. When approaching someone who lives close to the land and sea, it is not enough to ask, whenever you have this opportunity, how does environmental change affect you? Outsiders have far more to gain by asking the reciprocal question, what can we learn about environmental change from you? That sounded a little too much John F. Kennedy. Sorry about that. 500 years ago, the oldest residents of the Huamanga region of central Peru were famous for their ability to predict what would come to pass in the future by observing signs in nature. This is something I know from colonial documentation. Among the Lucanas of southern Huamanga, the morning star and the Ple what we call the Pleiades, known locally there as Alquilla and Larilla, were especially venerated. For Andean and Amazonian peoples, using the stars to predict the future was not an esoteric science. For the famous early colonial indigenous chronicler, Waman Poma de Ayala, who we've cited up there, and his gigantic, vividly illustrated Nueva Cronica de Buen Gobierno, uh, pub, uh, put together as a manuscript in the 16 teens, Juan Yumpa, who we have an actual portrait of in Juan Poma's hand, from Uchucmarca in Lucanas. For Juan Poma, this man, Juan Yumpa, provided the archetype for those, quote, indigenous philosophers and poet astrologers who know the circuits of the sun and of the moon and eclipses and of stars and comets, the hours, weeks, months, and years, and of the four winds of the world, and thus see what time to sow the fields early and late, unquote, as well as to decide the proper moment for a whole host of activities. In the larger discussion um, associated with that quote, Guam de Poma describes how Yumpa taught him that the day of St. John the Baptist, immediately after the winter, what is in the south, uh, global south, the winter solstice in late June, and the beginning of planting season in August were the most important sign times, as pictured here, for climbing high into the mountains to keep watch on the skies and look for these signs. This accompanying image of Yumpa implies also, if you see that thing in his hand, that he used knotted string kipu, an Indian form of knotting, writing using knots, to keep track of what he observed. Similar techniques are used today by, what, um, by indigenous, oh, well, this one, there, by indigenous philosophers today in the Andes and provide a technique understandable even to outside atmospheric scientists for predicting the arrival of intense droughts related with the El Nino phenomenon. From this perspective, Juan Yumpa, in our narrative of how we came to know what the El Nino phenomenon is, this history of discovery, Juan Yumpa qualifies as the first known El Nino forecaster that we could put a name to. Skip along here. I could give another example of another place in which this is done, but I want to skip now to show to talk about the Pacific world here. Much the same is true. Sorry, um, Andean peoples are not the only ones who closely watch the stars, birds, and other atmospheric phenomena for signs of the future. On the other shore of the South Pacific, on the North Island of New Zealand, Matariki, the same asterism we call the Pleiades, is traditionally viewed as a female mother with six named children. It is their appointed task to forecast fat or lean years as a bearer of food supplies. According to ethnographer Elsden Best, quote, the Tuoi folk say that if the stars of Matarique appear to stand wide apart, then a warm and bountiful season follows. 
clear skies, in other words. But she says, come to see... Come seem to be close together, but tokens a cold season marked by scarcity. In other words, if there's a hazy sky. Another version states that the stars of this group are indistinctly seen at that time of its helical rising, and they seem to quiver or move, then a cold sea, a particularly cold season, is going to fall. And if they are plainly seen at that time, in other words, they stand out distinctly at that moment, a, instead, a warm, plentiful season will ensue for growing sweet potatoes, another thing. Hence the saying, Nga kaya matariki. Nan iao aki ki runga. The food supplies of Matariki by her are scooped up. In my own research, discovered that much the same, this, uh, this precise watching of exactly how the Pleiades appear at a particular moment in the year, whether you can see many of them or just a few of them, uh, is used by Pacific Islanders in Micronesia, Samoa, the Cook Islands, and Rapa Nui, East or Easter Island. The head of the Rapa Nui Council of Elders, uh, Barto Holtus, told me in, while interviewing viewing him that, um, quote, Matariki, the Pleiades, tell us where we are going. And he shook his finger at me. We have a word in our modern culture for A, a system of knowledge focused on the natural world that, based on long-term systematic observation, that independently discovers or confirm existence of a coherent phenomenon that then can be used to make meaningful predictions. We have a word in modern culture for something that does all those things. That word is science. We should start using that word to refer to indigenous understanding, even if aspects of, a cosmo of, of these other cosmological systems are not quite commensurable with our own reality. And they also go on to say, tell the longer story about the reason we call this El Nino comes directly from these sort of inter interactions in reference to the appearance of the ocean during the festival of the Christ child. 25th of December for one part of the coast, later in January for the other part of the coast, moving Christmas, depending on what the ocean is doing on the north coast, of course, of Peru. So that's the end of this vignette, but to illustrate how I seek to inject um, something from outside conventional history of science, certainly, into a narrative of how science comes about understanding things about the global environment. Do I have a couple minutes? One minute? Okay. Um, just want to make a, to, to wrap this up, uh, bring in a couple reflections to, to bring this all together. And then this is also to open up to begin thinking about, well, what does this mean more broadly? Um, having collaborative control over the intro course is hugely influential in whether you'll be successful in injecting environmental humanities into the whole rest of things in the program. Those of us in the room, if you want to plot together, that's the place. From my experience, you should direct your attention to where humanities, if it wants to get in, to uh, what uh, the scientists are doing here or a place like that. That's the way to do this. Um, this is not all rosy. A lot of students despise and complain vociferously about having to make sense of a subject from so many different perspectives and so many different sources. In fact, we require the ability to integrate as one of the main parts of the evaluation or essay exams. This is even though from the very beginning of the course I say things like, there will not be a single Lord God professor in this class. That's not how environmental knowledge is created. That's not how it should be imparted, unquote. One reason maybe the students don't like that is they don't like me undermining God's authority. Um, that's when I click on my ruby slippers and say, we're not in Kansas anymore. Toto. Maybe I guess if I use, uh, there's no Lord of the Rings here, maybe that would go over a little bit better. Um, key point here is you can't fight every battle and you can't use course series like this to accomplish everything. Uh, ecologists complain all the time that, wow, EVRN student, EVRN students, pharmaceutical students, they just don't know as much about ecology as they used to. Um, duh, because we don't spend the entire time in the introductory courses on ecology. They, learn, they know a lot about other scientists, sciences as well, although, especially after hearing so many really great presentations on our interaction with the oceans. I'm an historian of ocean science and the ocean environment in the Pacific world to some extent, but I have failed to integrate the ocean in really a meaningful way in any of this, except to wave at El Nino a little bit. And, and you know, in the end of things, have to kind of admit terracentrism will continue to rule in Kansas out there in the middle of the country. Um, 
A couple more observations. What is in this for me? I have learned an enormous amount about the values of environmental scientists. Not as simply about their values in terms of society, but the values in which they think, what is good research? What do I look at first when I'm hearing an argument? What is going to convince me as an environmental scientist? Um, above all, the importance of the graph. Something that will turn off a crowd like this almost inevitably. I'm, I'm maybe not being fair, but if I'm talking to geologists about the Anthropocene, they'll be like, whoa. Great acceleration over before we even get to 1950 in this diagram of land use change that I referenced a bit. So I've learned a lot about how to present, to, uh, to talk to other people as a, part of, as a part of this in a meaningful way. And I'm hopeful that's going to have ramifications and publishing patterns and some, some things like this. Um, one last thing I wanted to say here. Um, conclusion. Everyone emerges from these courses. This is one thing I feel really confident about saying. If there's one thing that everyone emerges from these courses, faculty or students, undergrad or grad, is that they become, they're acutely aware that environmental science and policy and the basic ways that we tell stories about our place on the planet are always inevitably laden with values and laden with cultural influence. And that's not something that we can pretend doesn't exist. It's something we need to embrace. In the process, I also feel confident in saying we all emerge with better tools to make sense of that. And at least in that sense, I think the environmental humanities infiltration of environmental studies at KU has been an unvarnished success. Thanks very much. Thank you, Greg. So um, we now have some time for questions. Um, I think we have, uh, you, you both have raised a lot of issues um, about environmental humanities. It would be, I, I mean, I guess I'd leave it to the audience to decide what would be the most useful direction to take this discussion. So let's see where it goes. Should we gather up maybe three points, three questions and interventions? Okay. okay, so for Greg, I think that I really enjoyed your talk and the um, end when you're talking about first science and TEK, I think to me the lesson that I get out of all of that is that the environmental humanities absolutely cannot be the environmental humanities because when you look at something like indigenous science, TEK, first science, whatever you want to call it, the whole point is that there is no nature culture divide. Science is not separated from stories and cultural practices. And so if you're introducing those into a class, um, it, it, it shows that there, there, there cannot be, I don't think, it, it, it's such a thing as the environmental humanities separate from science and then separate from science studies and then also separate from TEK because that is, that's the issue here. You have to cross those boundaries. And your, your example showed so many crossings of the boundaries. But then, the, you know, the, the term environmental humanities is still used. And I, I understand that because, it, because we are the ones that have to sort of fight for why we're valuable and what we have to do. But I think in our classes, we really need to um, include science, science studies, and um, indigenous science studies perspectives. Um, and then, this is a totally different point, but since I have the mic, I'm going to make it. So, uh, for, for Dale, the slides that you gave, who are the quotes from? All the, all the website um, oh, stuff you're talking um, about, right? I mean, I can give them to you afterwards, but they were from both basically different sites of environmental humanities programs. Right. Um, so, I would, I would just say that, you know, we have talked a lot about labor today, and academic labor is labor. <laughs> And I would like to see those people get credit for their work sure. and their conceptualization. I found it really disturbing. I mean, I probably know a lot of those people too. So I've just found it really disturbing to see the quotes without any attributions. Yeah. Because it's, it really is undermining people's life's work in these fields. I mean, so let me just say I understand that, that point. And um, 
I was ambivalent about whether to do this or not because these were bureaucratic statements that I'm not sure anybody would really want to stand behind. And in some cases, by the way, the quotes weren't exact quotations. I put them in quotes because they were, in, they were part of this narrative. But in some cases, they were, so it was a bit, it was a bit hit and miss that way. Yeah, I mean, there were, there were no quotations from articles for which there were names attached. Yeah, I, I just, I think that uh, the, the work with that we do is work and does, even if it's institutional, and there is a gendered issue in that too. A lot of, a lot of women do more of the service work in many departments and so that plays out as well. So politics of citation. Thanks. So let's take um, two more. Mark. So thank you both very much for those terrific presentations. Uh, this is a, a question or engagement for Dale. Uh, I, I enjoyed the three personas, um, especially the third. <laughs> um, and I understand the first and the second, um, that you probably have, a comp probably have a complicated relation to those. So my comment is about the second one. And um, so I, again, I'm not really ascribing that you kind of are fully behind all of that. But so if I remember the way it was set up, um, we deceive, I can't remember the exact language, but in a sense, we've deceived ourselves. We, we think that we're doing environmental humanities to save the planet, but really we're trying to save ourselves. Um, and I guess, and then I think part of that has to go, do with the idea that instead of actually finding, solving problems, we problematize. Um, and so, so I'm just, you know, this is pretty standard, but it seems like one aspect of the humanities, not the only one, but one is kind of the joy of learning, discovering, exploring, problematizing, um, that it isn't always directed to saving the planet or solving this particular problem. Um, and I wonder if that's also an aspect of the environmental uh, humanities. And anyway. So hang on to that, Dale. Oh, we're going to get one more. Yeah, um, I was going to say, uh, part of what I was going to say it sort of echoed what you just said, so I'm, I'm trying to recalibrate real quick. Um, but one thing I did want to say is, um, and this is partly, you know, in, uh, drawing on, on what Stacy just said, that it seems to me very important to, to remain aware of institutional conditions, histories, um, <laughs> and realities, so that even if, uh, let's say, first knowledges contest the distinction between the humanities and the sciences, we live in a world in which, practically speaking, and in terms of resources, institutional prestige, you know, intra-institutional prestige, um, and many other factors, we have to be highly alert to the, the division between the humanities and the sciences. And I was very, very grateful for Timmons's opening statements about, um, you know, I don't know, sort of like intra-institutional conditions here. But it seems to me that one of the, one of the real um, propulsions behind uh, the environmental humanities is precisely, it's not so much like a strategic attempt to survive, but a pragmatic harnessing or response to a situation in which um, the, human, the environmental studies have been allocated to the social sciences largely and the natural sciences, in which a discourse of impact and the grand challenges has, you know, is driving a lot of the resource allocation in the universities. But that's coupled with authentic you know, you talk about sincerity. I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna see your sincerity and raise it to authenticity <laughs> via my, my pal Lionel Trilling. But, um, but, you know, a truly authentic relation to disciplinary uh, development and into true intellectual inquiry and, and seeing an opportunity. And that's often what we're doing. So, I mean, I, and I, you know, I just like really bristle at the attribution of bad faith to the humanities generally, especially when you start generalizing to you, the guy with the fedora. <laughs>
uh, starts generalizing about you know language and, and, and jargon and all that. Um, because no one says, oh my god, I can't understand this you know, theoretical physics paper. Something's very wrong in the world. So um, that's just one thing I want to say. And on the word lab, like I get it, but, and I get it especially for your course, because it's, uh, you know, uh, you, you get in, general education credit for intradivisional or interdivisional, but but I also feel like it's science envy. You know, I mean, in the humanity for the, the humanities lab notion, like I'm not against it or anything, but I do have mixed feelings about it because it just feels like, look, we're like the sciences, we have a lab. So um, that's just a little comment. Okay. So um, maybe you, in turn, could. Uh pretty brief responses because there's more audience interest in weighing in. Greg, you want to go first? Uh, just a couple super brief ones. Uh, one is to keep in mind that that little vignette I gave you was part of a larger and which was in, actually the first times we did this fraught discussion of some people in the room, the scientists want to say, what is the scientific method? And then they recite the thing out of the textbook that they don't even use. Uh, and um, after that happened, yeah, I don't even think it had to happen more than once, saying, it, let's stop and actually ask the question, what is it that you do when you go about doing science? And flip that conversation into, instead of, to the extent to which something is science if it follows a definition. In other words, something is science because the community agrees that it's science. Actually, how, how does that work? And then, in the process, bring in multiple examples from many different disciplines and actually from different cultural and historical circumstances. So that gives you a little bit more sense of context, uh, as you mentioned, is one of the things we can provide. Um, yeah, that's what's, what's going on there. And the, the, the lab and thing, yeah, I, I get that. Although I used to be teach lab, physics lab, so this is my, I get to do it again. <laughs> it's nostalgia. Three very quick comments. The first about humanities research for knowledge for its own sake. Same issue, of course, comes up with the sciences and why we have vast uh, investment in the sciences and, and it's not very well allocated if you're, what you're actually interested in is human welfare. And um, so there's a big issue generally between the relationship between knowledge for its own sake and activism and people have very, very different views about that. I'm not even gonna go there. But I will say this, in my own case, the scientists who I found the easiest and best for me to work with tend to be people who are at national laboratories. And in part, it's because they're not encumbered by the same usual university disciplinary boundaries. The, um, just quickly here, first in my own voice, I think your response is the beginning of the right response, which is that, I mean, part of the problem, I think, with the humanities and so on, speaking as somebody who's now in the tribe, is we love to deconstruct and so sociologize everyone except ourselves. And so the right beginning of a response is, in some sense, to accept the sociological retreat, uh, critique and then sort of go beyond it and show why it's not really a dismissive or deconstructive critique. The last point, speaking as the guy in the fedora, mostly with a bit of my own attitude, there is the feeling that it's one thing to have technical terms. It's one thing to be talking about parts of organisms for which there aren't pre-existing words and you can give a kind of operational definition. And there's another thing that happens, it seems, in the creation of neologisms in the humanities where so much of what the literature is about is about the, the language that is peculiar to the field as opposed to, to a term that's required to give a technical definition of something. That's the critique anyway, what the difference would be. Yeah, can, can I make a comment on that? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, this issue of investment is, I, is a big elephant in the room with this with regard to the differential allocation of investment by institutions like this or, or by the U.S. or Canadian or, or Latin American governments. Um, and this is a case in which scientists, and especially grad students who are, who are involved in this, who are getting science PhDs, are often really puzzled by the that clause you have to have at the beginning of every NSF grant. What is the broader significance of this? It's not just to the particular scientific discipline. It's what does this for mean for society, whatever, whatever that means. And um, that's some, one thing that uh, particularly the, that we see, I, I think that we can be quite helpful in terms of uh, thinking about uh, thinking about this, maybe not some. We're not maybe not so careful in packaging it, but at least thinking about how one can provide one's own answer to those questions. And one other thing about this is this is not all um, uh, hunky dory. Uh, 
a number of cases I've heard of in some of my own in which natural scientists looking to look, trying to make themselves look interdisciplinary will knock on your door and try to get you involved in something that has nothing to do with your interests. They don't care what our interests are. It's to make this interdisciplinary for interdisciplinary sake. Just say no to that stuff. Well, especially when you're asked and the project is already formed and, and they're even imposing you know, uh, theoretical frameworks uh, that you object to. I've had that experience. Um, but on the, on the issue of uh, the language, I think, in humanities, I think there's, there is a huge need for translation um, to language that can be understood by those in natural sciences or even social sciences of the humanities, the concepts and the, the terms, but especially to give the big ideas and, and to do a lot of the work of saying why your work is valuable and here's how it can, and unfortunately it actually relates to what you're just saying about being asked to be on somebody else's grant. I mean, you have to, um, you have to in some ways fit into their conceptual frames um, and tell them what's the value added. It's, it's awful, it's uh, I think, whatever, can often, um, Whatever, it's, it's, a, it's not necessarily honest to the full um, nature of what you have to bring, but at least there can be the beginning of understanding, oh, there is some value to having a humanities person on this research project or on this teaching, you know, to teach these classes together and why, why we need, as you know, we have four core courses in our uh, environmental studies program here and there really is no humanities one. Um, you know, we have economics, though, gets its own course, and, uh, and then there's a sort of a biology one, and there's a, there is a social science course, uh, and, I'm gonna, and then there's sort of a geology one, but there's no humanities one. So in winning this uh, battle for, I think, the bottom of the curriculum is quite important. Thanks. Thanks for we'll your papers. A and um, I'm bursting because I'm really interested in this notion of field formation. And um, not because I'm a bureaucrat, but because I think field formation is like, and how we narrate that is really political and ethical and about labor and about, you know, practicality and survival and all sorts of things. Um, and I had these conversations over lunch with a few people, so I, I apologize for the repetition for those people. But I think it's really important in this conversation to remember that environmental humanities is like an accident of naming, you know, that really only came about five years ago. Like 10 years ago, you wouldn't have a conference about environmental humanities. And most of the leading, who we would call the sort of leading figures in the field, didn't get an education in environmental humanities and probably might not even call themselves, you know, environmental humanities scholars. They're artists and biologists um, and philosophers and geographers and anthropologists. So um, I think there's a real, I'm not saying this is like a corrective, but just sort of as I think it needs to be in the room, a real danger of sort of all of a sudden talking about environmental humanities as if it's a done deal whereby the people who work in that field are most invested in being humanists. Because I think that's actually probably the furthest thing from the point, you know, yes, yes. right? And I think your example of your, your intro course really shows that it's not about being a humanist. It's most of the people who I know who are invested in this idea of environmental humanities, if not the name. It's because they really want to do work on environmental issues from complex, multidisciplinary perspectives. That's what they're invested in. Right? So, um, like, we could probably all throw away the, the word environmental humanities without a second thought. It's just what we've mm -hmm. now been given, right? So, um, it would be so sad if all of a sudden we got mired into these sort of debates about humanities when, like, maybe we just needed, to, like, just let's throw it away. I, I'm, I'm, like, part of the journal, I think, that was responsible for this thing, environmental humanities. And I'm okay with, you know, the name. I'll, I use it strategically and to whatever. But I don't want to, anyone to get too invested in it. It's so dangerous. And I think the work that you're doing in that intro course is the model, right? It's like, how do we get together with other people who want to think complexly and interdisciplinarily to do new things together with the sort of something that's more than the sum of its parts? <laughs>
And, and just to add, and also get students in on the very ground floor who are then are going to be going all of these different, the, that whole multitude of directions, because it pays the way, it increases the possibility. They, they don't know what a discipline is until they're schooled in it, right? Yeah. So right. why not show them that this is possible? Okay, so I think the language is hugely important, and, um, and, and, and this, is, this is an old issue. I mean, it goes on with environmental studies, for example, with that naming, it goes on with animal studies, which is another thing I'm involved with, animal studies versus critical animal studies. And it's very hard to sort your way through this because to some extent I sympathize with what, with, with what you know, what's in a name. At the same time, part of what's in a name with humanities is which division of the college you're in and what those funding flows look, look, look like. So, so a name may start as a name, but it may quickly calcify into something real. And I think one of the interesting things about environmental humanities which I think is in part driven by the fact that there are, there are so many people in literary studies in particular that anything you create that has an MLA presence is immediately a very large institutional presence compared to things like learning classics or philosophy or something, is there's already undergraduate majors in environmental humanities. This is when it's Stony Brook, for example. There are environmental humanities initiatives at many universities that will soon lead to graduate degrees if they haven't already. So, Yes, be careful about what you call things, but the names do become real and start having real. I think that's my point, right? Like, let's be careful, maybe, right? And I think that's also a very, you know, U.S. Perhaps, sorry, I'm keeping the mic. Um, but in different parts of the world, you know, that looks very different. Like in Australia, the hum like the the literary sort of aspect of environmental humanities is almost absent. You know, so. Um, yeah, and just to, to, to confirm this in the institutional context of Brown University, um, the one humanities field that has been successful at colonizing the uh, environmental studies is history. And it was partly done through this, the Kogut Center for the Humanities, um, you know, seeding postdocs working, you know, with co you know, collaborative searches um, with members from the Institute at Brown for Environmental Society and the History Department and then have then um, evolved into two, two hires, and these courses are starting to become more uh, you know, integral in our program. Um, can I make just one little point? Uh, the, um, it's also important to keep in mind that the, even Australia is a lot more similar to the United States than, um, for, for example, uh, university systems in Latin America. The sciences and letters, as it's called, are completely different tracks. They actually make a lot of what all of us are doing here impossible, no matter what side you're coming. So in, in some ways, the environmental humanities is a regionally particular thing um, regarding the pre-existing structures. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Clear? I'm, I'm not sure if I still have anything to add, because as the conversation goes on, I keep changing my thoughts on this. Um, but just uh, a tentative comment. Um, you know, all these debates about whether we should claim the term environmental humanities or not kind of frustratingly remind me of uh, questions and debates around gender studies, around, you know, all these dis interdisciplinary fields that attempt to undiscipline the disciplines and yet in needing to gather people around funds and in needing to survive and get a visibility need to label themselves, right? And so I completely, I wanted to just second what you said, Estrida, about the careful deployment, the, the, the careful, the need for care and, and um, yeah, and prudence about the deployment of this term. And at the same time, I want to say, as a junior faculty who has a contingent position in this university, who has sent so many applications to environmental humanities identified jobs and got rejection letters that said that we were 650 candidates. Um, that, you know, it's, it's actually, I think there are high stakes in funding behind those terms. So just like all these terms like intersectionality, for example, which I find to be conceptually a term very problematic in feminist studies and in gender studies that tends to reify that which it, it purports to critique oftentimes, et cetera, that term mobilizes funding in NGOs, et cetera, right? So, so I think there's a tension, and I'm, I'm not sure I want to, I want to second what you're saying, Estrida, but I also want to say that there's both cost and value in environmental humanities as a term. And, you know, like getting completely rid of it might actually get us, 
to throw the baby with the bathwater. Um, because, you know, I do think that in an ecological context like ours, we need theorists, we need philosophy, we need literature, we need history. And if this term can be a coalition-making term that's strategically deployed, just like we do strategic essentialism sometimes, for lack of a better, right? I don't know. That's, that's just my two cents on, those, on what I'm hearing. And I'm, it's very scattered. Sorry about that. But. Just one little comment, observation on this, on this point. One of the things that's different about environmental humanities in terms of the whole naming baptism process, if you will, <laughs> is there was no environmental studies. There was no animal studies. These were, these were attempts to find names for emerging fields. There is something in all American universities called the humanities. And so when you talk about environmental humanities, it's, it's like taking a division of the university and modifying it with an adjective, which is a, a, a very different thing. Different in a positive coalitional resource uh, obtaining sense? You didn't quite uh, clarify that, Dan. I think I said I was making an observation. <laughs> <laughs> Who's next? Um, so, so, so this is a question for Greg. There's a struck me there was an interesting parallel. I, I really appreciate the deep dive. I really appreciate the deep dive into the sort of microhistorical account of institutional development of the University of Kansas. And it struck me that there was a parallel between what you were talking about and what Bathsheba was telling us about, and then that they're both essentially stories of collaborations. Hers are a story of collaboration between the hunter and the whale, and yours is a story of collaboration colleagues across the university, both in a sense to try to survive in, in a hostile environment. Um, and, <laughs> and, you, and you're actually and you're both just giving his neck up. You, yeah, this, is not, this is not a coastal critique of Kansas, please don't forget it, but you, in your presentation, invoked Kansas, the, the place, uh, several times as part of your, you know, explaining some of the strategies that you adopted and so forth. And so what struck me as a different, as, as a sort of, as a contrast, if you allow me to make that parallel, is that it didn't strike me that there was much of a space for choice or age, um, choice on the part of the hunter. They weren't sitting there thinking about how they were going to survive in this environment. There was a model to survive, and that's what they deployed. Um, and you presented the presentation very much as a sort of forward-looking, optimistic, this is a strategy we can deploy. We have lots of agency. There's all kinds of possibilities. And I'm wondering if there, if you feel that there's a space for a different kind of account of what you did at the university, one that's a reactive account, perhaps not negative, but one that sort of doesn't look to the possibilities of the future, but looks to the, the, the terrors of the present, the precarity of the present, as, as, as a different way of understanding what you're doing there. And I don't know. Um, that's just, that's my question. Thanks. Um, I, the, and in one area I could give was a much more personal narrative than this that would then be alternative. One is that uh, I was told many times, that's not a good idea. That's going to be bad for your career. Um, why would you want to be in two programs now because you'll have twice as much service? And that's exactly right. But the service is actually interesting. Um, so there's that, there's that issue um, that uh, I'm a leading, I'm a lead, a leading um, the, the, this is not following the proven path. Another aspect of this, though, is the accident, contingency, again. I guess I'm falling back to the same narrative again, but the um, scientists coming to us Various people who sort of identify as environmental humanities, although many or historians of literature, the scholars, what we really call ourselves, um, and saying, and this was especially true of John Orser's uh, first um, perspective, is that they people were wanting to listen to him, like so many of us do, because he had things to say that made them think differently about what they were doing. So, in some extent, we're not the agents; we're the we were. The ask to do this, um, sometimes explicitly, and that NSF grant I, I, I pointed out, that's one case in which that really crystallized and helped make the grant successful because it would, um, it, we made, uh, now I'll just 
Yeah, <laughs> <laughs>